Well, we are turning attention now to the economy. Well, uh, so much going on. Uh, on pay salaries dotting all the front pages, at least the ones we've seen today. And uh, then you also have the Naira filling the effect. You also have uh, what crude oil having that uh, the dip in three months, the biggest of them all. So it does appear we're taking some sort of what pressure on the economy. Well, Dr. Khaled Dikakalu joins us now. He's a former Minister of Finance. Good morning, and thank you for coming on today, sir. Thank you. Well, let's start off with talking about this situation we find ourselves in about salaries. And uh, I know many will always say, look, not exactly a good idea to borrow, to pay salaries, but certain decisions have been taken here. Let's get your impression on how we're responding to it. First and foremost, uh, our approach to helping states pay their salaries. Is it going to come back and bite us or we seem to be okay with this? Well, I think the first shock is uh, considering the fact that we've just come up from a rather lengthy period of high oil prices, uh, accumulating uh, substantial amounts in various accounts, uh, the excess crude oil account, the sovereign wealth fund, and presumably other savings uh, arrangements that we have made, but all of a sudden we are faced with uh, such a crunch. Uh, in a situation where uh, we have uh, different sources of revenue, we will expect that whatever temporary measures we take now, at least to get the economy going, we'll be able to adjust and uh, account for some of the reasons why we are in the mess in the first place. In other words, I, I think uh, it's only to be expected that you can't let the economy go into doldrums because oil prices are falling over 40-45%. Yet, you still have to go back and find out what really happened. And I believe that the administration intends to do that from all the uh, picture we're getting. So it's, uh, it's expected that something needed to be done. So if you are borrowing, um, you have to be very mindful of how you are going to uh, organize to fund that borrowing, the term structure, the amounts involved, while you are at the same time trying to find out why you are in the, in the steep situation you find yourselves in the first place. You know, if you try to <coughs> marry this to, you know, you, you talked about borrowing, and I'm yeah. trying to relate it to what has just happened in the world uh, mm -hmm. in Greek. In yeah. Greece, rather. <laughs> yeah. For the first yeah. time, we're getting to see how this affected the young people. Mm -hmm. And they said, no, we don't want any bailout because of the mm -hmm. harsh conditions attached to this bailout. Mm -hmm. uh, are we bothered when we look at w how we manage some of these resources for state and even for the nation? Mm -hmm. And we keep borrowing. We know that it is all for development. Should we also be bothered when we borrow and look at some of the conditions that come with such loans and facilities? Well, whether it's domestic or foreign, we should be concerned with the conditions, obviously. And um, ideally, uh, we should never be in a position where we are borrowing to pay, to pay uh, salaries. You know, we have uh, different sources of current revenue, and then we do have. Uh, we should be expecting to be accumulating uh, capital surpluses, uh, so that. Nigeria shouldn't be in that position, but we we find ourselves in that position. That's what I'm saying. It's not that anybody will recommend it. I think it's uh, anathema that uh, some states were owing uh, months and months of salaries, and it just uh, breaks one's heart to imagine pensioners not being paid, and uh, to remember workers always agitating about the nominal level of their salaries, and yet those are not being paid. So there are, uh, we are in a situation where we have to look at the entire structure. Uh, this is not something we just patch up. This is why I'm excited. We have to look at the entire structure. Um, it's a shame, I must say, but uh, um, this is too short a program to go into all the details. I, I, but I can definitely, uh, there's no question that uh, we should not be as expecting this kind of financial arrangement that we are seeing now. Dr. Kalu, let's look at it this way. allocated from the federal government, from the, you know, from CBN to pay salaries. That's very, very unusual. It's not healthy. Very quickly, let's look at it this way. I'm trying to look at it from the perspective of being prudent. So prudence is very yeah, key yeah. here. Yeah. So if you are, uh, for instance, state A, mm. and you haven't been able to manage your resources, and 
the federal government has given you a form of bailout, mm -hmm. what will be the assurance and someone who is uh, managed funds and resources, uh, you're an expert in that mm -hmm. field, what, what will be that assurance or that fear for such states not to be uh, in the same problem again once uh, such monies are, are gone? Well, uh, there will always be caveats. Uh, there will always be structures that you have to put in place. Uh, in some years past, there were even more direct uh, methods of making sure you recover these funds. You know, you have uh, the statutory allocations that are shared every month. So the state has to agree on how much it can make do without over so many months. So at least you secure that. that that's one way you should start with, to make sure that a portion of what is uh, due to the state is then uh, deducted to pay for this uh, debt while you assist the state to get back on its feet. Admittedly, some of the new players are just new to their seats, so you can't really blame them for what happened. But the, uh, I am one of those that believes that um, we really can make the states viable if we have the right kinds of stewardship, not only at the executive level, but also at the various financial levels. The, the dwindling fortunes notwithstanding. Yeah, well, dwindling fortunes, you're talking about oil prices, but, uh -huh. you know, as we've said, for years and years, Nigeria was, uh, was carrying on very nicely until the early 60s, when oil started to become a significant portion of our revenues. We have lots of diverse resources. We've not developed any of this. This is what the surpluses in oil revenues were supposed to do, to help you develop the non-oil sectors. But we ended up calling it a cost, which is a very strange reaction to God's bounty to mm. call it a cost. We are supposed to leverage on it, direct revenues plus additional financing as long as those projects that will help develop the non-oil sectors were concerned. So we really have no excuse not having a much more diversified economy at this point in time, mm. despite the fact that we always talked about this diversification. Now talking about the non-oil sector, one yeah. of the areas where our uh, economy would seem to have taken a hit is the uh, forex reserves and we've seen how the central bank has been struggling in recent at least in the last uh, maybe eight months or if not more uh, to show up the account and to ensure that it's not depleted as fast as you know as it's been it's been done one of the things has come up with is this list of 41 items that are now not to be funded uh, from uh, by banks and even from the forex account of the country, it was him. Is this? Would you say that this in itself is enough? Well, uh, putting in the context, we have we are supposed to be having a fairly deregulated economy. The regulation, contrary to what some people say, is not just to open the place up for market forces or <laughs> open your borders for trade without any restriction. But the regulation means that you are really playing along with the pressures from the supply and demand. Mm -hmm. This is where, so the price continues to be a reliable guide. Now what the problem is, uh, I mean every country grapples with this, uh, not just the developing but also advanced countries. When they are pressed, they start going to quantitative controls and things of this sort. The idea is to really minimize where it is now you're just uh, using your own judgment. Let the market, let the pressures, the pressures that create the incentive to save and invest those are the pressures that should guide you, and therefore prices should be the most uh, accurate indicator of how the foreign exchange should be priced. But in the short term, you can do a few maneuvers, but I think it has to still be around the market. So one is uh, very leery about suddenly going back to the old days where you think uh, you want to dictate the taste of people, you want to dictate the structure of trade, the structure of production, which is what you begin to do when you go into quantitative restrictions. So, uh, yes, you can uh, manage some of that for the short term, but you must understand that this is symptomatic of much more structural problems. We talk about infrastructures, the cost of power, the cost of transport, the cost of transportation, the cost of communications. All of these things are the things that now impinge on the changes in supply and demand. So by just playing with the foreign exchange reserve and playing with quantitative controls, you may not fully appreciate the source of the problems in the first instance. That is the danger. 
Well, quite a number of people have lauded that move. They, they think that, you know, it could have long-term effects in terms of, you know, our pattern of consumption and maybe force us to think as to, you know, even personal, uh, maybe corporate lives, what it is that we actually consume on a daily basis and perhaps how our pattern of consumption could have an effect on our, you know, forex reserves and, you know, how it's taken a toll on our forex reserves. You seem to say yeah, that it's no, not... No, no, no. It's we're, a short We're really saying the same mm -hmm. thing. It's the question of what, I had, what ways do you want to get this indication? How do you stop people from importing toothpicks? Why should we not be producing toothpicks? It's not enough to get indignant when you get to that level because that's not really the problem. If you are producing, are importing toothpicks but you are exporting other furniture, other types of furniture, other things, you go to the uh, trade basket of most countries. You have the same items on both the import side and the export side. But there will be quality distinctions. So the, the, under, the structural issue is, are you producing? Once you are producing, there are, there are very little moral judgment about what you consume and what you, you don't consume. Let the price determine. If you can afford to consume something, you think somebody should consume, but you have to pay the but market price. We, we can answer that question as to whether or not we are producing. <laughs> that question. Yeah, no, no, but are we producing? So, no, no. Wouldn't the answer be no? Yeah, but then the question is not just no, but why are you not producing? You have forestry products, why shouldn't you produce toothpicks? Why all of a sudden you have to import foreign toothpicks? Of course, this is a very uh, funny example, but you can extrapolate this to other patterns of consumption. So the question is you have to address your productive structure. It's not just your consumption. You have to go back to I mean, Nigeria is so diversified, you know, we had all these uh, leather, wood, rubber, grains, name it. But we knew how, Solid uh, how, how it was then and yes. why, why, well, it all, why, why it all disappeared. Because no, it, well, it, it, it all I, disappeared because we started playing around with the foreign exchange.